Hey there, Daniel from GrowYourMusicStudio.com. In this video, we're going to talk about really what we always talk about, which is why don't people sign up for lessons? And really just diving into the nitty gritty of marketing and wh what you can do in your studio marketing to really make an impact. Now, some of the videos that I do are, are more cerebral, they're a little more high concept, and some are super, super tactical. Like I did some videos back in January about uh, some of the free traffic that you can get to your studio website and, and tactics that you can use to increase that web traffic. And that's great. This video is actually a little bit of both. It's one of those situations where um, a high level concept and how it can actually play out in things you're doing in your studio. You know, and I just want to acknowledge as well, it's been a little bit of time since I've done a video. So um, if you like this video, would definitely love to see, uh, see that in the comments. Maybe ask a question, hit that like button. Um, it really helps me out, share it with a friend. Uh, but anyway, let's get right into it. And that is this. Um, I am a big fan of the blogger Seth Godin. Uh, Seth Godin has written for a blog for almost 20 years on marketing. He's a very thoughtful guy. And if you haven't looked him, a lot of people know him, but if you haven't looked him up, you really should look, look up Seth Godin's blog. In fact, if you just go type the name Seth into Google, <laughs> his blog is the first search return. Um, that is how big of a intellectual heavyweight and, and how respected he is in marketing. Anyway, I digress. Um, Seth had a really in, uh, thoughtful insight one time that I have not been able to, to stop thinking about. It, it's something that, that I do think about often. And what Seth Godin said w was, um, people only spend money um, or time and money on things that they think are worth more than the cost. Okay, so that's like a big high level concept. But as a concept, people only spend time and money on things that they think are worth more than the cost. So here's where I wanna bring that down to what we're doing in marketing music lessons or marketing you know, music school, is that the reason that parents don't sign up for lessons isn't necessarily because the price is too high, um, it's honestly because they don't believe what they're going to get is worth more than what they'll pay for it. And I see music studio owners and, and you know, there's a lot of, uh, there are an increasing number of groups on Facebook that are dedicated to, to piano studio business and music school business. And at least once a month, if not more than once a month, I'll see people come on there and, and ask the question, you know, what if I just gave a discount, you know, discount for every possible reason, sibling discount. Oh, it's the month of February discount, like all kinds of things. Arbor Day discount. Um, look, the reason people aren't buying the piano lessons, aren't buying the voice lessons, violin lessons, guitar lessons, the reason people aren't there is because, is because, isn't because it's too high, it's they, it's they don't believe the cost is worth more than what they'll pay. And, and just as a further mental exercise, think about this. If you raise the price a couple bucks or lower it a couple bucks, in reality, is, that, is there some magic number? Like if, you're, if your cost per month is $100 and you lowered it to 97, is that going to cause a certain more percentage of people to sign up? What if you lowered it to 90 or 60? It's not what's going on there, okay? And this is where really what I want to get to. People are making a decision based on an emotional feeling, not a flow chart. They're not acting like accountants and think, okay, well, they said this and my child will get through books this fa People aren't doing that. They're not looking at this as an accountant. This is an emotional decision. Emotionally, they have to believe what they're going to get is worth more than what you're charging. And once they believe that, then they're going to make that decision. Okay, so if people aren't seeing the value, what can we do? What can we do to change that paradigm? What can we do to get them to see that value? Okay, so it's because people don't believe you enough, that they don't believe the claims you're making about your lessons, they don't love lessons enough, or they just don't care enough. Okay, and what I want to do, tactically speaking, is go into each of those three, talk a little bit about uh, my thinking on those right now, my current thinking, and I'll tell you that. From quarter to quarter, my thinking on marketing changes. Things that I was saying really heavily a year ago or two years ago, some of those things, they're not a message that I have anymore. And there are new things that I've even learned this year in the last three, four months that I'm beginning to implement and beginning uh, to implement not only for myself, but for people I'm working with. Okay, so um, Jay Abraham, 
who uh, is probably one of my biggest influences in marketing other than Seth Godin, who's also a big influence of mine, um, talks about customer education. Um, that no matter what size your business, if you educate your customer, uh, they'll purchase easier, they'll stay with you longer, they'll trust you more, they'll refer more of their friends. Uh, and, and on and on the list of benefits goes, that's just a couple of them. I, and I could probably do a whole series of videos on just that topic right there. I don't know, I might. My point is, is that if you educate your customer, it actually begins to influence these, influence these things I just mentioned. They'll believe your claims more, they'll love lessons more, they'll overall care more about what you're doing, what their child's doing. And of course, the parent being the customer, that's what we're looking for. So let's break it down. How do we influence their beliefs? Um, if they don't believe our claims about lessons, then there's a good chance that we're not doing a good job communicating what we think lessons actually could do. And it's not my intention here to, to give a uh, master class on copywriting in this video. I will just say this. You cannot have enough stories on your website, in your emails, in your phone consultations, in your trial lessons, and in the ongoing relationship that you have with the parents in your studio. You can't have enough stories. Tell stories of student successes. Tell people why you do what you do. Tell people why you use the method books you use. These are all fantastic tactics, okay? You can't have enough pictures. You cannot have enough pictures on your website, on your Facebook page, on your Instagram profile for your music studio. You can't have enough pictures in your follow-up, okay? Show happy, smiling kids. This is something I've been on for two years and I still have people where I, they, they, uh, they show me their sites and they're like, you know, my site doesn't seem to be working well. What's the problem? No pictures, no stories. Third one, videos. What we do as music instructors, as music studio owners, we're fun. <laughs> the fundamental thing we do is create performers, create people who can perform music. And yet not one in five sites that I go to has video performances of even one of their students. Um, and if not in their site, then at least a link back to a YouTube channel like I do, or a link back to a Facebook channel, which I also do. I have videos on both of those mediums. And it gives parents a tangible, realistic idea of what their child could accomplish with you. And what I'll tell you is that there's also a portion of this, which is that if you do this and other people around you aren't, it makes you stand out that much more. When everyone starts doing this, when everyone finally catches up and realizes this is what they should be doing, when music studio owners kind of kind of see the light and realize, oh my word, why have I not been doing this for the last decade? YouTube's been around since 2006. Maybe that strategy then won't be quite as effective if everyone's doing it. But I will tell you, until that time, you're missing out on a huge opportunity if you're not doing it. So pictures, videos, and then just following up. Follow up with folks. Um either people who've reached out to you for lessons, people who are currently in your studio, and continue to educate them. And how will you do that? Stories, case studies of kids who've done a good job, uh, the participation rate in your recital, the kind of work that kids put in the recital, any, any results that you're getting that are unusual for our industry, any results that you are getting that are especially inspiring. I had a student once, uh, her name's Maria, Got through the entire Faber series in just under 18 months, or right around 18 months. She worked incredibly hard, and I, I sent that out as a case study. I, I told a lot of families about that. I used, it, I used it in introductory lessons or phone consultations, and just told that story and told how it actually didn't take her all that much effort. She only practiced about 30 minutes a day, five, six days a week, for 18 months and got through the entire Faber series. Now she had a lot of love for music and uh, even when she wasn't totally in practice mode, she was going to the piano and playing things, she was printing things off the internet, but pretty impressive for, for an eight to 10, For because when she started she was eight, but when she was eight she started, by the time she was 10, she had done this uh, or completed this or she was almost 10. Very impressive for a child of that age. And um, it's a great story to tell, it's inspiring, it lets people know what is possible. So that's that. That's how we can influence their beliefs. Show, don't tell. It's the, kind of that classic adage. Second thing, how do we get them to love piano more? Here I want to be a little bit more realistic and say that we really can't. This is a place where the actions that we do might actually be detrimental if we're trying to manipulate or force people into an attitude or a, or a thought that they don't want to have. But 
what I'll say is that you can put the conditions in place. And um, this would be more along the lines of the children loving it and then that influencing the parents' perspective of the lessons. And the nearest I can tell, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here because I have spoken about this quite a bit over the last two months, the nearest I can tell is that when you make the process of learning music feel easy to a child, that is probably the number one thing you can do over yet another worksheet, over yet another music game, over yet another app, over yet another gimmick or program in your studio. If you just make it feel easy, to me, this is quite possibly the toughest thing a teacher can do. It's the toughest thing you can make a goal, but if you can do it, I think you pretty much can write your own ticket after that. And what I will say is that making it feel easy for a student um, has an awful lot to do with the way that you're teaching, not so much the method you're using. Something uh, a college professor of mine said, and I'll be very brief on this point, but something a college professor of mine said was that, you know, it's not the method, it's the teacher. It's not the method, it's the teacher. Boy, it has really stuck in my head because he said that almost 20, uh, well, not quite 20 years ago yet, but um, going on 20 years ago that I heard this, the idea that for us to, to look at individual methods and think that, you know, that can somehow materially impact a child's ability to get through music or material impact their love for it, it really, it really is the teacher. It comes back to that. And I will say just as a rule of thumb, and, and, and I'm going to move on from this point after this, because this is a little more cerebral. This is something, again, I could probably spend two hours talking about, but strip out what's unnecessary. The less complication you have, the more you, you send that child home with the songs already learned, the more you can send that child home with a feeling of confidence that they're not going home to learn, but rather to rehearse, that really is the key. And it took several years for me to kind of move from that place of being someone who just taught facts and expected the student to go home and get the music on their own. And, you know, my thought, my expectation of students, what I told them was, hey, come back and show me what you learned. And then I'm sitting there all week thinking, are they going to learn it? When I, when I dropped that attitude and I took an attitude of I'm empowering a child here to learn all their music here, sending them home to rehearse, and they're going to come back and basically play what they played when they, when they left, boy, kids, I, in my studio, I stopped hearing the phrase, oh, that's too hard. I honestly do not hear that phrase all that much. And at the beginning of my teaching career, I heard that phrase almost daily. Now, very rare occurrence. So that's what I would say about getting getting students and parents to love more. Because once the student loves it, the parent follows. They see the enthusiasm the child has. They see the excitement. They see the relative ease with which the child's going through that. They see the support you're giving them. And I mean, what are they, what are they going to do? Are they not going to love that? You know, my son's enrolled in soccer. I love it as he got better. As the coaches worked with him and he got better at playing soccer, uh, my feelings of ambivalence towards the sport and having to give up my Saturday mornings and Saturday afternoons to go watch something, boy, that really went away because he was empowered to do something. He was now more excited. He was better. You know, he's kicking goals or scoring goals and, and being a better defender. Oh, gosh, just as a dad, that makes me feel awesome. In the same way, that's, that's how I know parents who, are in, who have enrolled their students at my studio feel. So that's the second one. Third one, final one, going to be brief here. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, how do we get people to care? How do we get people to care about the studio, about the program, about the music? about you, about the relationship that you have with the child, about the relationship that the parent has with you. How do you get them to care? How do you get them to invest? And I'll lean back on, I'll lean back on something I said earlier or a source that I quoted earlier, which was Jay Abraham. And he says, to be interesting, be interested. To get people to care, you care first. And I'll say leading with that front edge of sacrifice, of service, of not really worrying about whether you're being taken advantage of, to truly lead with a feeling of that, with, with a attitude of, of that caring, gosh, that's really powerful. And, and it can be really picked up by parents. Um, they, they, get that, they get that sense. Now, how do you practically demonstrate the fact that you care? Okay, here's one really very practical example. It's something you could do in your studio this month. If you cared to, you could do this. I have often said that surveys have been the thing that have made business work for me. 
every business that I've been involved in, I've relied upon surveys to know what my customers are thinking. And I built my marketing around that. But a lot of times, even now, first off, most business owners don't go to that links. They don't care enough about their customer to actually survey the customer and figure out what kind of product the customer is looking for. But even those who do, they, they stop once they've made the sale. So once, this, once the parent is in the studio, they stop asking the parent what they want. Now, here's what, here's what I've done. Over time, I keep coming back to that parent as they're in different stages. So they have a beginner, they have a late beginner, they have early intermediate, they have an intermediate child, now they have an advanced child. At each stage, I ask that parent, either in person or through um, automated surveys that go out or through registration forms, I'll put a couple questions on there in the fall, and, and I, get, I solicit feedback from parents, and I'm trying to figure out what it is they wanna know and what they wanna learn. And here's the thing, if you ask, people will tell you. And from there, from surveys, and I'll tell you, I've gotten hundreds of responses over time. I've gotten hundreds of responses um, in conjunction with working with other people's studios and helping them run surveys and helping them analyze the data and kind of bringing my wisdom to that and, and helping them avoid pitfalls and knowing exactly what to do with the data. Nonetheless, over time, I've gotten a real sense of the kinds of things that parents want to learn from you. And what I will tell you is that is a golden opportunity to build more trust build more care, build a better relationship with the families in your studio. And the way you do that is by continuing customer education. Once the sale's made, once they say, yeah, we're in, they fill out the registration form, they pay you for the first time, that is not the time to, to think, okay, shoo, I can relax. Now it's go time, okay? It's like moving from dating to marriage. Once you're married, you don't think, oh, now is the perfect time. Now, now I can relax. It, it's all over, you know? Uh, this is great. You know, someone that's, you know, gonna spend all this time on me and doge on, you know, this kind of stuff. Like it, it makes no sense. Once you've made the commitment, you go even farther. Like that's when you can really begin to care for someone. That's when the relationship really begins. And my point is, is that there are so many ways that you can take the information that parents give you and, and uh, show that you care. A couple, couple examples. Once a month, maybe once every month, look at a list of topics that parents wanna know about in your studio and just write a simple email explaining from your perspective the answer and help them get an insight that they didn't have about practice, about what it takes for a child to get good, about how much time the child should be spending at home. Help let them off the hook. Help them not to feel guilty about the fact that maybe they weren't so great on practice this month, you know, as opposed to doubling down, shaming them or guilting them. Actually, write something that, that lets them off the hook, so to speak, and, and, and lets them see, oh, this isn't the end of the world. If my child's in this for the long haul, then this one month isn't gonna be that big of a deal. They will thank you so much. They will thank you so much for giving them that permission because to be a parent is to be guilty most of the time for the choice that you're making with your children. And I know this from personal experience. If, if you give them a reason why that, you know, that little bit of practice that they didn't get in this last week or the fact that they're only doing three days instead of six for, because, you know, during this very busy baseball season or very busy volleyball season, they're going to really appreciate that. That's one thing you can do. You can, second thing, you can design your programs in your studio around, you can design your stu uh, studio programs around some of those insights that you get from parents. And uh, after years of hearing parents say, um, you know, we're just really struggling with practice at home. We don't know how to support little Johnny at home. Little Susie just cries at the piano like every other day. What are we doing wrong? What are you doing wrong? Now, no one ever said that, but that I'm sure is going through their heads. I know it's going through their heads. Okay, what was my answer to that? Uh, duh, it took me six years, but I finally got it, and it was those comments I made earlier. It was really about me helping parents solve the practice problem and making it feel easy for students, and, and the way that structurally within my studio, I changed the entire way that I taught, I changed the entire way that I approach practice, okay? These things, when you respond to actual parent concerns, can be huge. Another thing is just making it more convenient for them. Um, over the Christmas break, I implemented, so I had a Christmas break from November 18th up until January 4th. And over that time, uh, my assistant and I implemented a new scheduling system in the studio. Uh, we got off, and this is kind of huge, and I don't know if I've mentioned this since Christmas break, um, because I did some, uh, I did some videos on systems prior to it, but now parents are scheduling directly on a calendar. They don't have to go through me. They don't have to go through my assistant. Um, 
and we're using an app that allows them to, to save it, bookmark it right in their, their browser, and they can go right in there and adjust themselves. Uh, there's no more back and forth. It's much more easy. They're getting to their, uh, you know, rescheduled lessons much more easily. It's so much less of a hassle. I announced this, and that very morning, I had a couple parents email me, and one in particular named Doug, um, who said, hey, we really appreciate what you're doing here. Uh, and I'm, I'm not exactly completely quoting, um, but this is pretty darn close. He says, keep up the good work. We really appreciate what you're doing. You're always making things better for us. The fact that that message is coming through is, is, is really huge. And that's a family that has stayed in my studio for a very, very long time. And I don't think that's an accident. And I'm not patting myself on the back here. What I'm saying is, is that if you do these three things, show, them how, uh, show that you care, um, help them to love piano more, and influence their beliefs, Help them to believe the claims you're making about your program, about your studio, about what you can do for them, about how valuable it is. If you can do that, uh, like I said, you're in a place where you can pretty much write your own ticket. And I see that question there, Brent. Um, this scheduling app that I'm using is called Acuity. And um, a couple of my clients use it. I actually learned about it from one of my clients. And I looked into it and really liked its functionality. It seemed to be an improvement over what we were doing. And so my assistant and I, we... We did some research and implemented it during a break time when, when, no one, uh, when no one was using the calendar so that we could switch to it cleanly over at the beginning of 2018. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. If this video was helpful, go ahead and hit that like button, share this with a friend, uh, write a comment below. Um, even just, uh, you know, if there's even one takeaway or something that you're going to implement, I would love if you'd tell me that in the comments. If you do have a question, I'm going to be in the comments here over the coming weeks and months. Um, honestly, anytime, um, and more than happy to answer a question. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you later this week. Have a good day. Bye.